Well, thank you, Sam. Can you hear me? Good. This is a beautiful facility. I want to thank NUMA for hosting us, and especially HasGeek uh, for organizing this event. Uh, Sandhya Ramesh especially has done a wonderful job coordinating things. Uh, thank you, Pranesh, uh, for that very nice introduction, and Srinivas and TJ for your very instructive um, presentations. And of course, Sam for dragging me to India again. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. So I have a strange profession. I am a public printer. You may have heard of private printers, right? They do novels in Hollywood and they publish things. Public printing goes back many, many years. There was a public printer named Ashoka, right? The emperor, the dearly beloved, who took pillars and edicts of government and spread them throughout India. And he did this so people would know the law and the Dharma, that they knew that animals should be treated properly, that different religions should be properly tolerated. In Rome, a couple hundred years before that, the people rebelled against their rulers and said, you have to write the laws down. You can't simply make them up every time we go to court. And they took the 12 tables of Roman law and they inscribed them in bronze and in wood, and they put them in every marketplace in the Roman Empire so the people would know what their laws are. And that's because public printing is something that belongs to all of us. It's different than private printing, where you do something to make some money, and then maybe 70 years later, or in this day and age, 150 years later, it enters the public domain. But public printing is stuff that we all own. And I've been doing this for 37 years in the, in the United States. Uh, everything from cultural archives, I put 6,000 government videos that the government had. We copied them, put them on YouTube, 50 million views. This stuff was just sitting there. Securities and Exchange Commission, it cost $30 to get the report of a public um, corporation, to get their IPO report, for example. We put it on for free. Hundreds of millions of people access that information. So about five years ago, I started working on Indian data. I continue to work in the US, but US and India are the two places I do my work now. And I maintain five collections. Photographs. The Ministry of Information has this huge collection of photographs that are online, but they're hidden. You can't find them. You pull up an index page and you know, there's a thousand photos on there. You gotta click through to get the actual photo. So I harvested those, took 12,000 of the photos, slapped them up on Flickr. And these are amazing things. This is you know, pictures of Nehru from 47 and 48 and 49, uh, pictures of the Republic Day, um, uh, celebrations over the years, a thousand photos of people playing cricket, uh, the Olympics, uh, animals, uh, the temples of India, just beautiful stuff. And there should be much more of this and it should be higher resolution. Bureau of Indian Standards, the building code of India, 14,000 rupees. Every engineering student in, in India, 650,000 every year need to consult this document. And they had to go down to the library and consult the one CD-ROM or go to the library and get that one book. And we put it online and we get millions and millions of views every month on those. Um, and in fact, we um, have not been sued by the Indian government. We've been sued in the United States and in, and in Europe by various standards organizations. But the Bureau of Indian Standards refused to sell us more. And the reason is because I sent them a letter. They, they, I was paying $5,000 a year to get the standards. And I ran it for a couple of years and they sent me a renewal notice. And I said, sure, I'd love to renew. And by the way, here's all the standards. Aren't they great? Can I give you the HTML? Because a lot of these standards we sent in to India retyped them into HTML, redrew the diagrams into SVG, coded the formulas into MathML, so you can see it on your cell phone, you can take a diagram, you can make it bigger, you can paste it in your document. So we're suing the government of India in public interest litigation. Srinivas Kodali is one of my co-petitioners, my friend Sushant Sinha, who is also here, who runs the amazing Indian Kanun, right, a service of all the court cases, is my co-petitioner. Uh, Nashith Desai and Associates is representing us for free in the, in the High Court of Delhi. And Salman Khurshid is our senior attorney on the case. Uh, we are before the judge again in mid-November 
it's all papered over. The union government has failed to respond for the fourth time. We are hoping to get an oral argument and to win this case because in India, in India, the right to government information is constitutionally based and these standards are government documents that have the force of law. Third collection, Srinivas talked about it, uh, the official gazettes. We're just starting on this one. We've got the gazettes of India up. Um, I've got gazettes now for uh, Karnakata, Goa, um, Delhi and a couple more kind of ready to start uploading and we're looking around trying to figure out how to get the rest of them. Collection number four is Hind Swaraj. I went to see Sam one day and he goes, you got a stick. I said, what? I pulled out a USB drive and he sticks it in his computer and he hands it back to me about 15 minutes later and I said, what's this? Collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, all 100 volumes, 50,000 pages. And I said, well, where'd you get this? Oh, the ashram gave it to me. Well, what are they going to do with it? Well, they're going to put it on a website. And so I looked and I said, well, can I put it on a website? Go for it. Well, won't they be annoyed? I said, no, nobody's going to care. And so I put them online and I decided since we were doing that collection, all 100 volumes, um, and you can search inside of them and you can download them as an ebook. Um, I went to another government server and I found the um, selected works of Nehru. But they were missing three volumes, so I got all those, found the other three volumes. Those are online, so we now have the most complete collection of the works of Nehru. Uh, the complete works of Ambikar. Dr. Ambikar was on the Maharashtra server. Uh, but again, they were missing the six most current volumes. So I, I took the, ser the stuff off the server, bought the remaining volumes, and we now have the most complete collection of the works of Ambikar. Again, on the Internet Archive in the Hinswa Raj collection. Um, there are 129 speeches from All India Radio of Gandhiji speaking. The last year of his life, every couple days he would speak after a prayer meeting. So you can actually listen to him speak in the last year of that amazing life. You can then go into the collected works and see the English version of that speech. And then you can go to the next day and see the letters he wrote, um, go see the next speech he gave. Uh, it's an amazing walkthrough. Uh, we went to the uh, Doordarshan archives and took Bharat Ed Koj, the uh, discovery of India as told by Nehru from the 1980s, and all those episodes are now online. For several of those, we've added subtitles in Telugu, in Urdu, in, um, we have five languages available as subtitles, and we'd like to do the whole thing that way. But I want to talk about the Digital Library of India because that's the current hot button that we're working on. So there was this government server that had 550,000 books. At least that's what they said they had. And a year ago, I was sitting with Sam. We had just finished our one week and we were waiting for our you know, late night flight to go back to the United States. And I was sick and Sam was doing a million meetings, people coming to see him. And I was looking around and I found this Digital Library of India thing. And so I, I looked at it and it seemed like it was harvestable. The books were there. It wasn't very convenient. Um, so I wrote a little script and it worked. And then when I got home off the airplane ride, I went back to my server and sure enough, we had collected some books. And for the next three months, I started grabbing books. And it takes a while. It was about 30 terabytes of data. Um, I ended up with 463,000 books that I was able to successfully get. Um, some of them I couldn't get. Some of them were broken URLs. But we got 463,000 PDF files. So this was December of last year. And in January, I did the upload to the Internet Archive. And, you know, these things take a while when you're doing that much stuff and uploaded them. And so this collection... Um, when I started looking at it in more detail, because I couldn't really tell until I actually had the data, this is books in 50 different languages. There are, I, I believe, 30,000 books in Sanskrit. There's tens of thousands of books in Gujarati and Bengali and Hindi and Punjabi and Telugu. Uh, you name it, it's all there. Uh, about half the books are, are in English and French and German, but it's a unique collection. Now, it had problems. When I went to mirror it, uh, the, the server kept, kept spitting out 500 errors. It, it kept breaking. And so my scripts kept breaking. And I'd go back the next day and I'd start the scripts again and I'd be able to get some data. And then they'd lose DNS. Their DNS servers kept going down. And so you'd, you'd ask for DLI and it'd say, host not found. And so I started hard coding the IP addresses because that was the only way I could grab the stuff. 
And there were other issues besides poor hosting. The, the metadata is kind of a mess. Many of the titles are broken. Um, the scanning, eh, some was good, some was not. Um, you know, the, the, uh, there's a lot of duplicates in there. But it's still, it's a unique collection. I also noticed there were some books that seemed somewhat adventuresome on copyright. I looked at it and said, well, you know, some of these are pretty recent. But, you know, I looked down at the copyright field, not copyright, and so I said, well, they must have known what they were doing. And I, I you know, what I do on archives like that is you put them online, and, and if people start complaining, you say, okay, fine, I'll, I'll take that stuff off. So I put it online. It went online in February of this year. We've gotten, I think, eight and a half million views on this collection so far. So this collection went online. Google started seeing it. People looked at it. We had, oh, a half a dozen people write to us and say, eh, you've got my book there. You know, standard DMCA takedown in the United States. Not a problem. Fine, we'll remove the books. University of North Carolina Press wrote to us. They had a list of 35 books. And it was a very nice note. They said, look, you know, we didn't mind that you had our books online before, but we're starting to put our back file online and sell it. So, you know, we'd rather the, that you didn't have them. And so we looked at their list, and then we searched in our database and found a few more books that they hadn't found, wrote them a nice note, and said, you know, here we are. If you have any more problems, let us know. So in total, we took about 127 books off. Not a big deal. Now, <laughs> there was a guy in Russia who found his father's book on the Internet Archive, and he knew one of the professors that was involved in this digital library of India, and he freaked out. He, he was going to sue. He, he just got very, very angry. And in return, the professors that had started this project off, very senior people, freaked out as well. And they went to the government, and the government got all upset. And I started getting all these notes saying, you must delete all the books. You must get rid of them. And I was like, no, we're not going to do that. Um, and so they actually took their server down. So we now have the only copy of the Digital Library of India on the Internet. I've actually renamed it because they were worried that it looked like we were somehow, you know, affiliated with them. I said, okay, fine, we are the Public Library of India. Um, <laughs> so they removed their, first they removed all the books. So you could search for the metadata, but you couldn't get the book. And then they took that down, and there was just this obscure notice saying, due to copyright violations, this is not available. We'll come back soon. And then the metadata became available again, and then the server disappeared altogether, and then the copyright notice came back, and now it's still gone. It's just, it's off the net. And what I understand is happening is a team of government officials has, has spread out to these 10 different libraries, these scanning centers where they got the books, and they're going through the list one by one, and they're deciding which ones will be available and which ones will not. And they told us that they will notify us which books should be available. So when they first freaked out, I, I went and looked at the system a little more. And their, their initial feeling was that we would remove everything. And I said, no, we're, we're not removing 1 million views per month, 500,000 books. We're just not going to do that. And they said, OK, remove everything after 1900. And that would have left us with 60,000 books. And I said, why 1,900? And they, they just made up the date. And so at first I said, okay, fine. I'll remove everything after 1923. And that left me with 200,000 books. And then I went through the remaining 250,000 that I had, and I looked carefully at that list. And, you know, many of them were official gazettes, right? Or they were the works of Mahatma Gandhi, which we know does not have copyright. Um, or there were other things. And so after looking at that list carefully, I, I brought it up to about 314,000 books, which is what you can see now. And they still want to tell us to take everything offline, and I just don't think it's the government's job to tell you what to read and what not to read. And there's something even more important. Copyright is not a binary thing. So for example, all of those books I could make available to somebody who is blind because there's an international treaty that says that copyright does not apply when you make books available to the blind. It's, it's a, one of the more progressive things in copyright law. At some point, there will be no copyright, because copyright expires. We have no idea when that'll be. So we're certainly not going to delete them, because eventually we can make them available. You may be familiar with the Delhi University case. And the Delhi University case, 
cited the Copyright Act that says you can make it available in an educational um, uh, setting for teaching between a teacher and a pupil. So we could make all of these books available within a university campus. So, it, you know, deleting the books is not the right answer. Managing the metadata and making it better, um, working on translations, uh, doing better OCR, right? Because we can OCR some languages, but others we can't. Making it better, responding to copyright issues. One of the things with the DLI server when it was online, I actually tried writing them when I first started to mirror the thing. I didn't get any answers. And when the distinguished professor finally, you know, came to me, he said, well, you know, you did this without talking with us. And I said, look, this data's been spinning since 2015. We just assumed nobody was home. We assumed nobody was there. I would have loved to talk to somebody, but nobody would talk. And that's why I just went ahead and grabbed it. And not only that, you know, these are books. You know, once it's on the internet, um, I can't hack your server. But if it's public data, and public data is something run by the government, then I have a right to take it and look at it. Now, I obviously bear responsibility if there are subsequent copyright issues, but we're ready to deal with those. So that library is online. Now, you may ask, why does this stuff matter? Why, why do you need public printing? Well, it, the world right now is in disarray. I don't know your feelings about the world now, but inequality of income has been growing, poverty, um, disease, hunger. India, India has a surplus of food, 200 million people don't eat, right? We can solve those problems. Climate change, these crimes against our planet. As you can see from global warming, this is not some far-fetched idea. This is real. This is science. Intolerance, violence against people of other religions, violence against people of other ethnicities, violence against women and children, intolerance, Intolerance against ideas, the, the horrific shooting of Gauri Lankesh here in Bengaluru. Fake news, right? Nazis getting on Facebook, coming up with fake stories, helping elect our president in the United States. And the question is, what can you do about something like this? I believe that every generation, every point in time has an opportunity, right? If you're technical and it was the early 1960s, you'd be like Sam. You'd help invent the digital phone switch or invent computers. If you were in the 1950s, you might have been working in aerospace. Same goes with social issues. There are things we can do, right? If you were living in the 1880s, you would be battling against involuntary servitude. You would be following Gandhi. I believe that our opportunity, the unmet promise, is universal access to knowledge. It's something we can do. We can make it happen. And the reason that matters is because a democracy is owned by the people. And the key to democracy is informed citizens. And so I believe the key to change, you can't solve global warming today, but if we all understand what's going on with our environment, I believe we will start to take actions. So I believe the key to change is two things. Now, Gandhi told us that one of the keys to change is love. When you see the Nazis, you don't go beat them up. One of the things I don't like about the current debate in the United States is we have the alt-right, right? And then we have people going in saying, let's beat up Nazis. Well, that's not the answer. Gandhi and King both taught, taught us that love is the answer, but they also taught us something else, which is that if we want to change the world, they were invoking Justice Rana Day here. If we want to change the world, we must educate ourselves and educate our rulers. And so both King and Gandhi, before they committed Satyagraha, they spent an intense amount of time educating themselves and then educating their rulers. Before Gandhi left for Dandi, for the Grand March, he spent a month in that ashram training himself and his fellow marchers. He sent petitions to the government saying, I am going to do this. And so I believe education as well as love is a key thing. Um, Rabindranath Tagore um, felt that way as well. When, when Gandhi tried to uh, remove basic education because he didn't like the British schools, 
Um, Tagore published his call to truth, and he said, our mind must acknowledge the truth of knowledge just as our heart must learn the truth of love. Right? You have to do both. And so I believe that knowledge is the answer to fake news. Right? You don't solve fake news by censoring it, because you can never do that. But you can have better news. You can have true news. Um, if we want to solve the problems of economic op opportunity, we have to happen just by itself. Gandhi was a big fan of what he called bread labor. That comes from a, a Bible quote. And for him, bread labor at first was printing, right? When he went to the Phoenix ashram, everybody had to use that printing press. Every day, everybody did manual labor with the printing press. Later on, it was the spinning wheel. Well, today, Gandhi would say that coding open source software every day is bread labor. It really is. It's manual labor, and it makes your world better. You're making something real. The other thing that Gandhi taught us is about public work, that we must spend part of our time. It's fine to have a business. It's fine to make money. That's good. But we also, if we want to own our governments, which we do in a democracy, we have to be part of it. Um, on the front of every one of the standards that I publish, there's a cover sheet. And it's got elephants and it's got, you know, logos and stuff like that. But at the bottom is a quote from the Niti Shatakam, and it says, knowledge is such a treasure which cannot be stolen. And I totally agree with that. Knowledge has to be shared, and I think that's our opportunity. So thank you very much. I think Sam and I will take questions now. All right, try to use a microphone because we're, we're live on the internet, so that way people will be able to hear your questions. And we got about a half hour, so you know, we'll, we'll field anything you got. Um, it, it was a great talk by both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the question, questions I had was about uh, the kind of atmosphere we have uh, these days, right? So the, the discussions are, of course, I mean, if you meet in this kind of communities, you're having discussions about innovation and data and all of that. But otherwise, the discussion.